we'll get class going here now. Uh, I'm just going to do a brief summary on our speaker, and then I told him I'd do the grand long one when we have worship. Uh, our speaker to this morning is Betty Clore, his wife Susan sitting down there with Kay. Uh, he literally is going through the world with the Word of God. They have books and they're all translated in 29 different languages. And right now, one of the biggest concerns they have, and he's going to speak on it, is Ukraine. And uh, when he talks to you about that, you'll be, it'll be mind boggling to know what they've been doing in Ukraine. So, Eddie Clor, it's all yours. Thank you very much. It's always a privilege to be here with you, brethren. Certainly a great privilege to be introduced by Brother Jack. He is one of my favorite friends in all the earth. Thank you for letting me come. Our procedure is normally for me to come once a year and tell you about the work that we are doing. What a wonderful day it was whenever our Lord arose from the dead. He probably arose from the dead before dawn. And after he arose from the dead, there was an angel that came down from heaven and rolled away the stone from the entrance to the tomb. It has been said often, perhaps Josh McDowell was the one who popularized the saying, the angel did not come down from heaven to roll away the stone from the sepulcher to let Jesus out. But the angel came down from heaven and rolled away the stone to let us in. He wanted us to see that Jesus had really arisen from the dead. No human eye saw Jesus arise from the dead. That was between Jesus and God the Father and I guess the angels. After our Lord arose from the dead, he set aside 40 days during which he was going to fulfill three goals that he had in mind according to Acts 1, 2, and 3. The first goal was the goal of confirmation. Acts 1, 2 says that after his passion, he made it visible to others that he was really alive by many infallible proofs. That is, he said to them, touch my hands, touch my feet, feel my side. I'm really alive from the dead. Confirmation was very important to Jesus. Number two, he had the goal of conversation. Acts 1, 2 says that during that 40-day period, he was conversing with his disciples about the coming of the kingdom. They knew something about the coming of the kingdom, but they didn't know nearly enough, according to our Savior. So he talked with them often about what the kingdom was going to be like and maybe some idea of when the kingdom was coming. Then number three, his third goal was that of commissioning. You know about this commissioning. You've read the great passages in the New Testament about it. We have a clear presentation of his commission in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We do not have one in John. John just simply says, as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you, John 20, 21. But in the other accounts, those in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there will be several details that are given about this commissioning. I'm just going to refer to the one that's found in Mark 16, 15, where our Lord said, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who has believed and he who has been baptized shall be saved. He who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Now, we don't have to read this passage twice to understand that Jesus gave a commission regarding the whole world. And I believe we've misnamed it. We refer to it as the Great Commission. Well, it was. It was the Great Commission in many ways. But I really believe this commission should be named the Global Commission. Jesus has arisen from the dead he has created the gospel, 
And now he takes that gospel and he gives it to his disciples. And he says, here's what I want you to do with it. I want you to see that everybody on earth gets it. That's the commission that I'm giving to you, my disciples. So it's appropriate for us to raise the question, how are we doing? How's the church doing what, what Jesus plainly told us to do? Are we obedient to Jesus or not? I have it on good authority that 29% of the people on earth, that would be over 2 billion, will never hear the name of Jesus during their lifetime. And they will never see a Bible, much less have an opportunity to read it. And then we have to say that beyond that, maybe 21% of the people of the earth are in great oppression, religious oppression, where they're not allowed to study the Bible. They could be uh, put into prison. So uh, they are left out. So that brings us up to about 50% of the people on earth who have really been left out. We haven't been able to do anything about them. But as you think about the 50% that we can do something about, we are estimating, now this is a guesstimate, that you put together everything that we do, all the campaigns that we have, all of the missionaries that we have going out, you put together all of the things that we do, and you have the churches of Christ reaching out to about 20% of the earth's population. Now remember, about 80% of the population of the earth would be speaking other languages, languages different from English. And most of our work, most of the work of the churches of Christ would be in line with English. We don't get out into the other languages very much. So the point is, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of thinking to do. I wrote an article just this last week that's entitled Global Thinking. Do we ever even think about it? We have a lot of thinking to do. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of programming to do if we're going to be obedient to Jesus. So it is appropriate also for you to come to me and say, okay, if you're going to talk to us about mission work, tell us what you are doing about reaching out into all the earth. And so that's what I will attempt to do. First of all, we really think a lot of the national preachers. We have about a thousand American missionaries that have gone out to be full-time missionaries. Our daughter and her husband are two of those. You have to count a couple as two in order to get up to a thousand. But obviously we're not going to be able to evangelize the world with just a thousand American missionaries. So as we think about this, it comes to our minds that if we can raise up hundreds and even thousands of national preachers, we have done the right thing. The national preacher is of value to us because he's already over there. We don't have to send him over there. He's already over there. He also understands the culture. He understands the people. Here's somebody who's already a Christian. We're riding piggyback on missionaries that have gone before and they've left behind men who would like to preach. Every man who would like to preach should be one of our targets. That we want to make sure that we help him do the task that he can do. We need him. Now this is not going to be correct. I found out just on uh, Friday that this is not correct. We're down to about 21,000 because we had one man who oversaw about three Indian languages to die during the coronavirus. So we had to withdraw our sending out the issues for a while. We're trying to get that back. We're doubling what we're doing. So this will come up to 31,000, but right now it's down to about 21,000. But that's still pretty big, 21,000. It's the largest mailing of our brotherhood. There's not anything else like it. I wish that were not the case. We ought to be mailing 65,000 instead of 31,000. But we send them a book like this. We pay by weight, so we keep it small and thin. But we get a lot of information in it. If you have 
about five books like this, we can make a commentary out of that material that would be about this size. So I'm trying to illustrate, we do send them a lot of material and we send them expository studies. As you think about 31, 21,000 men outside the United States and 140 nations of the earth, as you think about them, you realize those are so many different cultures. That's right. And it makes an almost impossible situation. How do you mail to men in 140 different cultures and do it successfully? Well, here's our rationale. God has one Bible for the whole world. So if we would stick to expository studies, that might help us a lot in crossing the cultures. And so that's what this is. This is a study of a portion of the Gospel of Luke. So what we try to do is to send him a piece of the Bible that we have explained as carefully as we can, leaving out any slang expressions, leaving out any jokes, because those do not translate very well, and trying to just get down to what that text says. It helps him a lot, and it makes a better preacher out of him. We mail to 21,000 right now. That will be coming up to 31,000. And we are sending them each expository studies. We send those out every month. We continued to send these out during the coronavirus. We did not miss one month. We stayed with it. We managed to get that done. And these men are baptizing no telling how many. We don't even try to keep up with how many they baptize. And we don't even try to keep up with the number of churches that they establish in the course of the year. Now I'm writing this, so you may want to read it with a grain of salt, but I believe this is the truth. The top priority, the top priority for the church is not having cushions on the pews. The top priority of the church is not having a good PA system, although those two are very valuable to us. It's not our prop priority though. Our top priority for the church must be, must be, if we're thinking about global coverage, if we're thinking about doing what Jesus asked us to do, then our top priority must be providing accurate, well-written, well-explained, well-translated messages of the Bible for the servants of the Word throughout the world. If he's going to be a preacher of the Word, if he's going to be a minister of the Word, we want to help him. He's on our team. We need him. We're in the business of trying to cover the earth and we're going to do everything we can for that man. There are three big ways of covering the earth. And you know what they are, don't you? Number one, sending out American missionaries. Now, I'm not talking about somebody going over for three weeks. That's what I do. I go over for three weeks. But it doesn't help a lot. It costs a lot. But it doesn't help a lot. The people who are going to help us are the people who go and stay and they have their babies the way they have their babies. They wear their shoes. They eat their food. They are one with them. They're one with their culture. And can I say this? Would you listen to me? Can I say this? Perhaps one of the worst things we can do when it comes to covering the earth is to congregate here in America. We're not going to evangelize the world that way. I know you like where you live. I know you enjoy what you do. I know you enjoy your job. You enjoy all the blessings that you have. But don't you understand? 80% of the people on earth are waiting for the churches of Christ to bring them the gospel. And for us to do it, we have to go. It's not going to be easy. Was it easy for the Son of Man to come into this world the way he did? For our salvation, was that easy? It's never easy to be a missionary in a world like ours. It's going to take men and women with courage, with dedication to do what Jesus told them to do. That's our first priority. Well, that's number one. Trying to raise up national preachers. I'm not saying this is our world coverage effort. I'm just saying it is a big coverage of the earth and I believe that it needs the attention of all of us. If there is one more national preacher out there, 
that we could encourage, that we could lift up, that we could inform to preach the gospel. Let's get him because our mission is to cover the earth with the gospel. Here's the second way that we're trying to reach out into all the earth. And I believe this is global. I really believe this is a global attempt. You look at it, think about it with me, see what your conclusion would be. But I really believe this is right. In addition to raising up preachers, we want to raise up teachers. The finest thing that you can do for Brother Myron as he preaches is to be a teacher. He needs to know when he gets behind the pulpit that there are many teachers in this congregation. And they are busily engaged in teaching others the gospel. It's not how many members you have. It's how many people are you taking through the life of Jesus each week and each year. How many teachers do you have who are really involved in teaching people around them the life of Jesus? We really like these two books. I have uh, copies of them here. I know you can't see them very well. Maybe you can make out what I'm talking about by looking at the PowerPoint and watch these books fall off the pulpit. But maybe I'll get your attention one way or the other. <laughs> but here are the books. They have nothing on either side. Uh, we, we don't have anything on the outside of them. It's just a plain book. These are the books we send overseas. But let me show you what we're doing with these books. We went to David Roper and we said, David, you're our best writer. You're one of the best writers in our brotherhood. Would you take us through the life of Jesus? Would you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Don't leave out a single sentence. Put commentary in where commentary is needed. But make sure you have covered the life of Jesus somewhat chronologically as much as we can. And prepare that for us to use in other ways. He did it. And we put them in commentary form. There are two commentaries then. That would be about 1,200 pages, I think, if I remember correctly. A wonderful study of the life of Christ. And may I say this, the most powerful thing on earth is the life of Jesus. And may I also say that the finest gift you could give anybody is to take that person through the life of Jesus. It may be a child. It may be a grandchild. It may be a grandmother, grandfather. maybe an aunt or an uncle. Maybe a person who lives across the street. The finest gift you can give them is to take them through the life of Jesus. Well, we believe that this is what we need to teach, the life of Jesus. At least this is where we need to start. So we have divided the earth into ten parts. And maybe you can see how we've divided it. I don't expect you to be able to read all the numbers that I have up here, but at least you can see that we put the whole earth on the table. This is global thinking. We don't know how we're going to get into the Middle East. We don't know what we're going to do with China. But at least we've got them on the table and we've begun thinking about it. How do you do this? How do you get the gospel into these places? And we are trying to uh, take on these tents of the earth. We're trying to take on three tents of the earth each year. This year we're working on Latin America, America, and then what we call English three. That would be Australia, the Philippines, Britain. Scotland, Ireland, maybe we're throwing in Alaska, American Samoa, other places that speak English. But those will be the three that we're working on this year. But we want to raise up 5,000 teachers in each tenth of the earth. People who could teach the life of Christ pretty effectively. And then we would like to have as an alternate goal or at least uh, as a goal that goes along with the raising up of the teachers, to win 5,000. If we raise up the teachers and turn them loose to teach others the life of Jesus, they will surely be teaching people who will become followers of the Christ. Well, I wanted to show you a better picture of what we do send to people overseas as we try to make teachers out of them. We have what we call a teacher's box. I should have brought one, but I didn't. But I uh, did have a slide that I thought would make sense to you. We have two sets of these in the box, two sets. That is four volumes. 
We have uh, two Life of Christ one. We have two Life of Christ two. We have a set for the teacher, and then we have a set for the person he's going to teach. So if he has to, they can just read it together. They can just read through the life of Christ together if they have to. So you have somebody that you're interested in. You want to teach that person. You don't know how to do it. Maybe you've not been involved in person evangelism before, but you would really like to tell them what Jesus has said. All right, get two sets. Set for yourself, set for that person that you're interested in, and read through the life of Christ with them. There are eight places in the study of the life of Christ that we call salvation insights. Eight times that Jesus talks about salvation in clear terms, like when he was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And whenever you come to those salvation insights, make sure the student understands those. Make sure that Jesus is doing the teaching and you're not. And that you're putting before that student, you're putting in his head what Jesus said about salvation. And you can just do that so often, and that student probably is going to be talking to you about becoming a disciple of Christ. Most likely, you're not going to have to ask him. He understands. He'll drop out. You've got to keep him in the study. But if he stays in the study, eventually he's going to talk to you about what he needs to do in order to be a disciple of Jesus. And then we have uh, two other volumes in the box. We had two smaller books in the box. This has a complete New Testament in it. And we call it Becoming a Faithful Christian. Uh, sometimes we call it Into the Abundant Life, but we put two of those in there. We have a board member who really wants to do that. We have sent over a million copies overseas. And we're convinced that Every person who gets one of these and keeps it and reads it will either become a Christian or he will share it with somebody who will become Christians. We think that every book we send overseas will result in somebody somewhere becoming a Christian in the life of that book. And then we have one little book that tells the recipient of the box how to be a teacher. And we want to send 5,000 of those boxes to 5,000 people who are potential teachers, raising up 5,000 teachers, and challenge them to teach somebody around them, maybe a friend, maybe a relative, a neighbor. I've been talking to your Hispanic preacher, I believe, about this matter, and he's already turned in some names to me before I could even get to the pulpit. You know, while Jack was introducing me, giving that eloquent introduction of me, he had me over there on the corner and he had three names he wanted me to send boxes to. Well, I'm glad. That's the kind of enthusiasm we need for covering the earth. Do you know of someone in Latin America who would be a good teacher? Do you know of somebody in Australia who would be a good teacher? Do you know of somebody in the Philippines who would be a good teacher? Do you know somebody in Britain, in London, in Scotland, in Ireland who would be a good teacher? Give us that name contact that person and say, would you be a teacher? We'll get you a teacher's box if you would be a teacher. We want to cover the earth. We don't want to be negligent about what Jesus has asked us to do. Well, I wanted to show you in green what we're trying to do this year. Now, this is going to be sort of a general presentation. We are going to Alaska, but we've covered it all in. We don't mean that we're going to every person in Alaska but these are the areas that we're trying to touch this year. Is that all right? That's about half of the earth. Why can't we think that big? If we're not thinking that big, why can't we? Do we not have the right gospel? Do we not have the right message? Do we not have the right plan? What could be a better plan than urging people to teach the life of Christ to the people around them? That's the best plan for you. And that's the best plan for people overseas. If you're not teaching somebody the life of Christ, maybe you'll want to repent. Maybe you would want to think more deeply about it. What did Jesus tell me to do? The Great Commission is not just for elders. It's not just for preachers. Go you. He was talking to disciples. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You're all that he has in some cases. There will be somebody in your life 
And you are the one that Jesus has to talk to somebody about Jesus. And if you don't do it, if you do not effectively teach them the word of the Lord, then it could well be that they will never have anybody to teach them. And they will have to meet Jesus without having obeyed his gospel. Number three, we are wanting to develop students. We want to develop preachers. We want to develop teachers. We want to develop uh, students. And uh, you probably know about this. We are building a classroom in the cloud. And maybe you've already visited that classroom. It's already live. It's a classroom in the cloud. And it has 445 courses already. This is a course. And it will have five to six tests that will go with it. And we have begun translating uh, these commentaries that we have done into 22 languages beyond English. Total of 23. And we want to have all of the Bible, all of the studies that we have done, we've got 50 now. We're writing commentaries as quickly as we can. We have 50. We've got about 16 to go. It'll be the largest study of the Bible that our brotherhood has done. And we've gone to some of our finest men, their PhDs, their doctor of ministry degrees, master's degrees. We've gone to those men where they can write it well enough, understanding Greek and Hebrew, and maybe in some cases Aramaic, and they can give you a good commentary on the scriptures. No prejudice involved here. We just want to go through the Bible and deal with what the Bible has to say. And we put all of those in our online school, in our cloud-like school. And we are busily engaged in translating all of these commentaries into 22 languages. These two books are in English, and then they're in 22 languages beyond English. And whenever you calculate how many the 22 languages could reach out to, could reach out to, it would be uh, maybe as much as 70% of the population of the earth. Now, they have to have a computer. They have to have some connection with Internet. But that's sort of the way the world is going. So we want to be on that track. We want to be uh, getting ready for whatever is going to take place tomorrow. And no telling what we're going to face 10 years from now. We want to be ready. We want to have our materials translated and reaching out to that 80% of the earth's population who... Uh, do not understand Greek. I thought I'd put our languages up here for you, those bubbles. Each bubble represents a language. So we've started with the big languages and we're going down. The number one language on earth of native speakers would be Mandarin Chinese. Number two is Spanish. Number three is English and on down. And we need to add two or three other more languages. We need to add Swahili, we think. We need to add Italian. We don't have those right now. But if you get all those together and you get our 65 commentaries translated into those two languages, uh, those 22 languages, never happened before. Never happened in the history of the world. And the churches of Christ would be providing at least an opportunity for people around the world who have computers and connection with internet to study through the Bible just like you do. In Bible class, you study through the Bible in your Bible class and you take it for granted. But there are many people around the world who can't even think that big. They can't even think about having an opportunity to go through the Bible. We want to leave that. And that's the reason why we ask for a place in your will. I don't mean to intimidate you. I don't mean to rile you in any way. But I challenge my brethren, would you at least Leave Jesus a child's part. And set that part of your estate up so that it can be used until the end of time. So that as we try to put programs like this together, we have the funds to do it. We don't have to spend all of our time raising the funds. The brethren is saying, do it and we'll back it. We'll see that you have what you need to do to do it. That's the business we're in. We're the church of Christ. We're in the business of covering the earth. We're in the business of seeing that the gospel goes forth in all of these different ways. 70% of the population of the earth. 
Our online school is in 90% of the land area of the world. Now I want to dovetail into saying a little bit about the Ukraine. I think I have time to do it. You might want to keep me posted on the time. I don't want to go over time. But keep me posted on it. I think I'll hear a bell and that'll give me about three or four minutes. Truth for Today started the work in the Ukraine. I don't mean that in the wrong way. I just mean by the providence of God, it fell our lot to start it. I had a young man in my class who was from right outside of Donetsk. He came up to me and he said, now I believe the Ukraine is wide open. And if you'll put together some sermons and get them on tape, I believe I can get them on television free of charge. Well, I didn't know if he was right or wrong. Our brotherhood at that point was just going over into the Ukraine just to see what was going on over there. No campaigns had taken place over there. We didn't know whether they were ripe or not. And I said, well, Susan, I will do our best to help with this. We got together a total of 25. Now, we would made up four of those 25, so we got together 21 others who were going to go with us. We didn't know where we were going to stay. When we got on the plane, we didn't know whether we'd have a motel room over there. Everybody was so happy about going, and Susan and I were biting our fingernails wondering, what are we going to do when we get over there? But the Lord went before us, and we had places to stay. And we put up just a little statement on the front of a palace. They call them palaces. It would just be a hall. And we had on that statement, there will be Bible lectures here tonight. And we gave the time. We didn't know if anybody would come or not. They didn't have cell phones. They just walked by and see what was going to be taking place in that hall at that time. 125, I think, came the first night. Second night, 250. Third night, we were up to 500. And we maintained 500 the rest of the way through. Susan and I went down and paid $300 for the local TV station to come inside the building and film every presentation that was made. And then the next day, they would put it on the television air at 9.30 and then 7.30 at night. They replayed it twice. And they told me that the television programs were going out to uh, 6 million people. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they told me. We call this our first campaign. We call it the first campaign the Churches of Christ had. And we were really trying to find out what's going on over here. Are they receptive or not? We were just bum by what we saw. We didn't know how to extend the invitation. I had a preacher to stand at the front. We didn't have an invitation song. They didn't know our songs. We didn't know theirs. And I told them, now, if you want to become a Christian, you just come up and tell this preacher down here. He's got a translator beside him. You can communicate with him. We've rented a swimming pool not too far away, and we'll baptize you tonight. We didn't know what was going to happen. We wanted to make sure they were well taught. And whenever we ended the service, they didn't know English, but they had learned one word, baptize, baptize. And they gathered around Chick Allison saying, baptize, baptize, baptize. We had brought three baptismal garments for the women and three for the men. We took them over there and baptized them. Every night they came. Every night we would have 20 or so responding to the invitation to become Christians. We thought it was a fluke. They're responding too early, we said. We helped them get the second floor of a theater, $15 a month. And they would meet there in that. And uh, we came back to America. We met in the corner of the Chicago airport. And we said, listen, we're into something that's really great. And somebody's got to go back. Who will go back? Who will go back immediately? One man said, you give me one week and I'll be back over there. Another man said, let me talk to my wife. If she is ready to do it, we'll go over and stay two years. And all of those men went back. The man who went back to stay two years went to a veterinarian. He said, now listen, I know you've got a job, but I want you to put your work on hold. And I want you to go with me to the Ukraine it's time to go. They're waiting. They're waiting to hear the gospel. So he 
put his veterinarian work on hold and went and stayed for two years. We met in our living room in August and we said, we've got to do this again. But next year, we've got to be bigger and stronger and keep up with our television coverage. And so we call this our second campaign. We took 208 with us into uh, Donetsk, that city that's being bombed right now, in 1994. We had 11 campaigns simultaneously. They didn't have cars. So we had a campaign in every part of the Ukraine, of that big city that we were in. People came. Whenever we gathered for the first night, the speakers would have to climb over people in order to get the pulpit. And they would preach and people would respond. At the end of the campaign, we had baptized 1,545. I know that sounds far out, and I know you're probably not going to believe me. We established 11 churches. We combined three or four of them, came out with seven as a result of that campaign. And we told all of those new converts, now we want you to meet with us on Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock as we get ready to leave the city. You had to ride a bus 15 hours to get in there. And there were no service stations. Would it be all right for me to say this? When we stopped, the women would go to the trees on that side and the men would go to the trees on that side. But we told them we're going to leave at 2 o'clock this Sunday and we want you to be in the Linen Palace for us to say goodbye to you. And we're going to have the preachers to say a word of exhortation to you. We didn't know if we'd get all of them or not, but we got a good number. Uh, we're estimating we got a thousand of them. Now remember, before I show you this, it's very emotional for me. And remember, they're new converts. They've been baptized in the last 10 days. Most unusual thing I've ever seen in my life. We taught them to sing, God is so good. Almost every night we would sing that song. And so we had all 11 preachers up there, and each one was going to take a minute and a half, and then tell them, read your Bible, pray, do this, do that. We got down to the last preacher, and the last preacher didn't have anything else to say. Everybody had covered all the topics that should be covered. And so he said, I don't have anything to say. You just sing in Russian. We'll sing in English, and we'll sing together. God is so good. Remember, all of these are new converts. It's unbelievable. I don't hear the sound. We had the sound going but they are singing. I wanted you to hear them sing. They in Russian, we in English. But this will give me an opportunity to explain it. Those are all new converts. I mean, they were baptized in the last 10 days. You don't see many young people. These are adults. These are adults who <laughs> for us to believe it. But we knew that the Ukraine was ripe. And so whenever we came back with those 204 that we had taken over there, we told them, you go to your elders, you go to the preachers, you go to anybody you can find and tell them to go to the Ukraine. And all across America, churches began to go to the Ukraine. And they would establish churches just like we did. Go have a campaign, hit the ground teaching. They're ready for teaching, and go teach them. And all of those cities that you've been seeing on television had churches of Christ in them. 
And if you go to the internet and look up the religious affiliation of most of the people in the Ukraine, it'll have 87% Christianity because the churches of Christ went. Well, we started sending a booklet. Uh, we started this in 1995. We set up our translation center there in Donetsk. And we'd send the booklet out to all of those who were trying to teach and those who were trying to preach. We'd sent booklets out to people across the Ukraine, across Russia, and we did it for 28 years. And then we were interrupted in 2014, whenever the Civil War occurred. We kept sending it to Russian people, though. We just couldn't get it into the Ukraine. And then when the present Civil War started, we couldn't uh, send it even into Russia. But our head translator is still in the Ukraine. She talks to us uh, every other day or every few days. We send something to her every day that she translates and gets out to the people that are still in the Ukraine. They are wonderful people. They really love their land. They want their land. They want their homes. In most cases, their homes have been destroyed. But remember, this should hit us pretty hard because this is family, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And Tante Anna, the last time we talked to her, said, I ask you to pray for me and pray for us last time. And she said, I want you to pray for us now twice and three times because my husband has gone over to the Eastern Front and he's going to be right in the middle of all of that bombing that is going on in Donetsk. But the very place that I've shown to you is under siege right now. There are brethren. Pray for them. Be ready. Be ready to help them. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We're going to continue to send materials in. We've got to do it. EEM sends books in to the schools, but we sent books in to the preachers and the teachers to ground them in the Word of God. And they would utilize our materials to teach people who were infested with denominationalism. We happened to get there before denominational churches came in. And whenever the denominational churches came in, our brethren knew the difference. And they stayed with the truth of the gospel. Help us all you can. We can do more. We can do more. I can do more. We can all do more. We have a wonderful time with where we live and what we do here. And let's use the blessings that God has given to us to see that the world gets its opportunity to hear the gospel.